Psalm 13, how long? And how long is one of those things that we have dealt with? You remember when you're a kid and you're on a trip and are we there yet? And when you're the adult, um, how long before they stop whining? Um, all through life we have the how long. This psalm is a reflection of that whole concept of longing for something to happen. But that's been going on, you might say, since the beginning of time, pretty much. The how long. We're going to look at a bunch of different um, chapters and verses. I'm not going to read through them all. I'm just going to, they're going to be up on the board, but just kind of so that you get the context. You might say you'll be able to see for yourself instead of me actually reading all of them. I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to go through it, and we're going to look at history. And we're going to look at this whole concept of how long and the how long is it before the coming of Christ. Because this is looking from the perspective of an Old Testament vision. Because that's Psalm 13, Old Testament, Psalm of David. So that's how we're going to look at this and walk our way through it and see how Psalm 13, when looked at through the eyes of an Easter message, is what it is. So, Psalm 13, for the choir director of Psalm of David. This is another one of Psalm of David. Verse 1a. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now let's go back and start. In the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve sinned, and God had came to them, and to the promise of the seed of the woman. That was the first promise of the coming of Christ. So it's going right back to the beginning. And from that point on, the people of earth constantly, at least those that were believers, constantly were wondering how long. And over time, when you're thinking about something for a long time, slowly on your mind changes a little bit in what you're longing for. You're longing for this thing is going to happen, but I don't know exactly what it is anymore. And here over the generations, we'll see that. Then we move on to Genesis 7. And this is with the ark. And Noah enters the ark. And you should stop and we've got to put ourselves kind of in that place. God had said that it was going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. So Noah and his family would have known that. And you can imagine on the 30th day, I mean, how long has it been? I mean, it is really wet out there. And slowly on, the ark rises. And after the 40 days, you know, I say it's, it's continuing. Now the how long is how long before we get out of this ark? And they spent a long time there. Um, it was 150 days, according to Genesis 8, before, the, before it started going down. But you can see the impatience factor. See, we think of you know, Noah, you know, a good, righteous man, and you know, God told him to do this, and he was just doing it. And we fail to remember the fact that he was a human being. And those that were with him were human beings. Remember, he sends the bird out, and it doesn't come back. Because it was how long before that can, we can actually land somewhere? How long before we're saved from this? And then he sends the dove out, and eventually the ground does dry up. But it's how long? We're always wondering how long. And then you've got the next set. If I can get my paper to turn here. In Genesis 11, the building of the Tower of Babel. Now it was a case of, you look at this, the, the people of the earth are longing for when this redemption is coming. Slowly on it's gotten to the point they're saying, well, it's not coming because it's been a long time. So we're going to build our own tower that reaches up to heaven. We'll elevate ourselves to heaven. We don't need to wait for this promise. I've waited too long. And God says, no, you're not waiting yet. It's not time yet. In Genesis 16, we got the same scenario to a certain extent because Abraham has promised a seed. And from that seed, the promised Messiah would be coming. So Abraham and Sarah, they kind of get down and say, you know, Abraham, you're 86 years old and um, 
you know, I'm kind of getting up there in age myself, so maybe we got to help God along a little bit, because how long can we wait? Because we can't wait any longer. So Hagar comes into the picture, and they have this son Ishmael, which we're still dealing with the after effects of that today. But now at 100 years old, Abraham has a child with Sarah, his wife, who's 90 years old. See, they were to wait, but we don't like to wait. We always say, how long before this? How long? God has his own timing. So when we get impatient, stop and think, for all those years that Abraham and Sarah waited, and nothing was happening, nothing. God had made a promise to them, but God didn't say exactly how long. He just said it was going to happen. See, with us, we're always in that same concept of, you know, I want this, I want that. God, move this, move that. How long do I have to wait? And it's the same thing David is saying at the beginning of the psalm, if you remember. How long? And then we have a whole host of examples in Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith chapter. Moses. Remember Moses? 40 years in the schools of Egypt, 40 years as a prince, and then he decided that he was the redeemer and he's going to go out and he's going to see to it that the children of Israel have a leader and they can get out of this place and get out of this slavery because God had promised it. How long? Well, God, you're taking too long, so I'm going to do it myself. Well, that didn't work out so well. Now he spent another 40 years out in the wilderness, um, basically giving up. God had told him that he was to be the one. And then God comes back to him in the right time. Because Moses needed the training of the Egyptians. He needed the experience of the wilderness before he was ready to perform the task that God had called him to do. 80 years. That's a long time schooling. Now, there are people that I've known that have probably gone to school for 80 years. And you know people that lived their life in school. Um, a guy named George, he was, he, was kind of, he had to have been in his 80s, well in his 80s when he died, but I think he was always in school of some sort or other. Um, but Moses wasn't planning on that because he was saying, how long? And then finally, finally the time comes when they leave Egypt. And then they out in the wilderness, and they're wandering. How long? Remember the uprisings that took place? They took place because of the fact things weren't moving along fast enough. They said, instead of waiting on God to, to take care of these things, we'll take care of them ourselves. And it always turned into a disaster. Thousands always died every time they tried to fix it themselves because they didn't know how long and they didn't want to know they wanted to just move forward so they pass through the red sea the, the walls of jericho come down now we're really going along okay we're i mean things are really going good but just remember they spent a whole long time there because the first time when they came to the promised land they didn't believe that god would help them so God says, well, you know how long it was going to be? It was going to be tomorrow, but now it's going to be 40 years from tomorrow. Because you weren't patient. You didn't trust me. And there's Gideon, there's Barak, there's Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, the prophets. All of these were talking towards the promise of the coming of Messiah. Every one of these were talking about that the Redeemer of Israel is coming. And they're longing for this. There is actually a, um, a Jewish tradition that is probably true because it makes sense, that girls growing up, they longed for the one that would be the mother of the Messiah because they knew a child was going to be born. They knew it was going to be the line of David. So those that were in that line, you know, is it me? Is it me? But then we got to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read this one, 10 to 12. 
As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of this grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time or spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them they were not serving themselves but you. In these things which now have been announced to you, though these, those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things unto which the angels long to look. Now that line in there, the angels long to look. See, you have to remember something. The angels don't know God's plans. We think that, well, they're up in heaven with God, so they know everything that's going to happen. No. God's plan of salvation was so special and so unique and so un, but you might say unprecedented, whatever, but the angels were trying to figure this out because they knew that God had promised the Savior, that God had promised there would be a way for the people of earth, the sinful people, to escape this punishment. And the angels, you can just imagine, they're, they're trying to discuss amongst themselves, trying to figure, I know God's got a plan, and I, and I know we, we know it's true, we know it's going to happen, but how can he possibly make this happen? Because God had also said that if you sin, you die. So the angels are trying to figure this out. How can there possibly be a way that God can be true to himself and still save his people? we got a conflict here, because if God says if you sin, you die, and then God's going to save you, so you're not going to die, well, that doesn't really fit. So they're longing for this. What is this reality of this thing that's going to happen? What's it really going to be? And you've got to remember, nobody really totally understood that until afterwards. So we have to look at it again. We're still looking at it from Old Testament eyes. In Luke 19, this is the triumphal entry. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. All these people are gathered around because Jesus has now been walking on earth for three and a half years. And they've seen all the miracles that have taken place. And they really realize that now we have come to the point to where our Savior is here. So they're just ready to anoint him as King of Israel because he is going to take care of the Romans. He's going to solve our problems. And they're just shouting out. And they're basically, they're almost trying to force him into becoming their king because... He's the only hope we have. Now, back to Psalm 13, verses 1b. This one, that was verse 1, the first half. This is the second half of that verse. How long will you hide your face from me? In Mark 16, this is when after Jesus had been crucified, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the mother of James, they came to the tomb. Now, why did they come to the tomb? They came there to anoint the body with spices because Jesus had died. So they, here again, the hope has been shattered. They're a prime example of that hope being shattered because Jesus was the hope, but now Jesus had been killed. Jesus is dead. We have nothing left, but at least because of our respect, we're going to go and we're going to anoint the body. Verse 2, back to Psalm 13. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? In 1 Peter 5, be of sober spirit and be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. How long shall I take counsel? How long shall I wait? How long was the enemy going to be exalted? We look around in our world today, and evil is exalted. How long is this going to continue? Because the suffering is being accomplished. Satan's work is going on, and he's accomplishing a lot of things. 
Verse 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. In other words, not, it's not just how long, it's how. How are you going to do this? The thing that here again, the angels were looking forward to. How is this going to happen? Uh, 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now the how has been figured out. Because Christ himself will confirm you, perfect you, strengthen you, establish you. All these things are going to take place. Now, when the curse came, the curse in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't just Adam and Eve that were cursed. All of creation was cursed. And the earth itself, we don't we fail, fail to realize this, creation itself is calling out, how long? In Romans 8 and 19, for the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. See, this is the same thing that the angels are looking forward to. How is it possible for God to redeem his people? The earth itself is saying, how long? How long before God is going to redeem his people? How long before the people of God are going to be seen as the people of God? Matthew 27. This is at the time of the crucifixion where they're mocking Jesus. Because the whole concept of how long Jesus is the promised Messiah, Jesus is the one that is going to save his people. And then he's being hung on a cross. And they're mocking him while he's on the cross. They're saying to him, you saved others, save yourself. If you truly are the Son of God, save yourself. They're mocking him. Verse 5, but I have established in your loving kindness, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. In John 19, verse 10, it talks about on the cross, when Jesus cried out, it is finished. The how long is almost to an end. And then in Matthew 28, we have the next step of this he is not here. This is when Mary had come to the tomb. And they come there to anoint his body. But what did they find? An empty tomb. And an angel saying, he's not here, for he has risen. Now the how long is getting a whole lot closer. Because it has been, Jesus on the cross that it is finished, now he is back alive again. And what had happened in the meantime? He defeated death. Death has been defeated. So that curse that was placed on Adam and Eve's descendants has been lifted for those who will trust him. In Acts 1, verse 6, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is, is it th at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? After the resurrection, after Jesus' death and crucifixion, his resurrection, now the disciples come to say, are you now going to take, get rid of the Romans for us? They still didn't realize what the how long was pointing towards. They thought it was pointing towards a political victory, a military victory, that Jesus would now be their king forever, and the land of Israel would be the world power. They still didn't understand. In Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, which we looked at that a minute ago, but not this part of it. And all these, all these having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. I've always found that line interesting. All the Old Testament kings and prophets and that, all these, they were promised all these things. And here it says, and they never received it. Now, God made a promise and they didn't see it. They didn't understand the promise.
because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. That's another really interesting line. See, the, they were longing towards this Messiah. The Messiah had come. So their longing for had been accomplished. But it didn't accomplish in their lifetime. But God says, you just didn't realize what the promise was for. The promise was for a whole lot more than what you would have received in this life. But then this part where it says, apart, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Now, how in the world are we any part of making Abraham perfect? Doesn't that seem strange? But it's true. Because it's the fullness of the people of God that makes it perfect. And it can't be the fullness until the last person comes to know Christ. This is when the end will come. We want to know when it is, how long? When that last person comes into the kingdom, then it's filled. The fullness has come. We have no way of knowing, just like we had no way of knowing when Christ's return is going to be. We have no way of knowing exactly when that is going to happen. So we can start with our how long. Because all the way from the time of Christ's resurrection, which we are celebrating today, until his return, we are again under that how long. The promise is made. The promise will be kept. We just don't know how long. Verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because he has dwelt bountiful with me. Read that little verse and like, yeah, I mean, God has really blessed me. I mean, I, it's, it's really wonderful all the things he's done in my life. Look at this. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That bountiful, that's our salvation. That's not, not getting a flat tire on I-40. That's wonderful, that's nice, but that's not the bountiful. The bountiful is so much more. Matthew 11, 28, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest because we understand that bountiful is so much greater. All the little troubles and problems in this life are nothing compared to that bounty that's waiting for us. Romans 5, verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Saved by the blood. As today we are celebrating the risen Lord, he rose after being crucified. It is his sacrifice that answered the angel's questions of the how are you going to. God, how can you say that if, you, if a person sins, they die? and then you are going to save them. Jesus was the answer. They didn't realize that until it happened. That Jesus dying on the cross became the sacrifice. He stood in our place. He took our sins upon himself and said, I am guilty of the sins of the whole world. I take them upon myself. And in order to atone for those, I have to be perfect. I also have to be a man. I have to be a human being. Jesus took all these things on himself so that he would provide that way. He would provide that possibility that God in his words of shall die to shall be saved, that that bridge between the two, something had to happen. And it had to be a perfect man taking on themselves voluntarily the sins of the world and being killed and then being raised again. That had to happen just like that. And that was the thing that the angels were longing to know. We should be longing to know the how long before you're coming again, Lord. 
as we're looking forward to that, knowing that it's far greater. Stop and think that the children of Israel were looking forward to a nation that would be ruled here on earth with all the things that this earth has to offer. All those wonderful things like diseases and, you know, let's say afflictions and all sorts of and troubles and trials. And instead where they get? Glory. Heavenly glory instead. That was the trade-off. What's our trade-off? We go from this life to a life of glory. We just don't know how long. And then one more question. How long are you going to be waiting to call Jesus your Lord.